the English football scene has long been shadowed by a notorious drinking culture, with many of its brightest stars succumbing to the allure of alcohol. In today's video, we will show you which football icons are affected by this and dive deeper in the ongoing struggles. Notably, Arsenal's Tuesday club became infamous for its indulgence in heavy drinking sessions. It wasn't until Arsene Wenger's arrival at Arsenal in 1996 that a significant shift began, promoting the benefits of a healthier lifestyle. Wenger's influence was evident when 19-year-old Jermaine Pennant, hung over from a night out, scored a hat-trick in 2003, marking a turning point towards professionalism in the sport. Despite these changes, reminiscences of the old culture persisted, with Damien Duff recalling rampant drinking sessions at Chelsea under Jose Mourinho's early days. Rio Ferdinand also admitted to being engulfed in such a culture during his tenure at West Ham United, with his drinking affecting his game performance. The grim consequences of this culture are highlighted by the tragic deaths of football legends like George Best and Garincher due to alcohol-related issues, along with the ongoing battles faced by players like Tony Adams and Paul Gascoigne. In 2021, the death of Peter Whittingham in a pub accident starkly reminded the football world of the dangerous liaison between the sport and alcohol. This endemic problem has not only affected the careers of numerous players, but also reflects broader societal challenges, pressing the need for a continued transformation within the football community towards health and responsibility. The tune, Be Young, Be Foolish, But Be Happy, could well have been the anthem for a generation of footballers who have pushed the boundaries of behaviour in English football. In an age where the sport is awash with money and media attention, some players have fallen into a lifestyle marked by excess and poor judgment, epitomised by the infamous case involving Leeds United players at Hull Crown Court. Jonathan Woodgate and Lee Bowyer, despite their legal entanglements and the light sentences they received, represent just the tip of the iceberg in a culture where youthful folly can escalate into serious misconduct. The cocktail of immense wealth, free time, fame and a sense of invincibility has led to instances of arrogance and detachment from societal norms, particularly among the elite echelons of footballers. The narrative of Woodgate serves as a cautionary tale, his community service sentence a mere slap on the wrist compared to the deeper issue of alcohol's role in his actions. Both Bowyer and Hackworth, emerging relatively unscathed from their legal battles, should take this as a stern wake-up call to reassess their lifestyle choices. English football, beyond its glossy exterior of lucrative deals and commercial success, faces a more insidious challenge in addressing the underlying issues of player conduct and welfare. The sport's governing bodies must look beyond mere financial gain and take responsibility for guiding young players, ensuring they grow not just in skill, but in character. The players themselves must confront the stark realities of their actions and the lifestyles they lead. Past incidents like Tony Adams's jail time for drink driving serve as stark reminders of the consequences of unbridled indulgence. Managers, now overseeing millionaire athletes must navigate the delicate balance of instilling discipline and moral rectitude in a generation lured by the temptations of wealth and hedonism. The transformation of English football from its working-class roots to a global powerhouse has brought both excitement and higher standards, but it has also magnified the flaws and excesses within its culture. The drinking sprees, public misdemeanors and tabloid scandals that have plagued the sport are symptomatic of broader societal issues, with footballers often mirroring the hedonistic tendencies prevalent in modern British nightlife. The tales of late-night revelries, dressing up in combat gear, and the unchecked behaviours at club parties highlight a disconnect between the players' public personas and their private actions. High-profile incidents such as Fowler's arrest underscore the need for clubs to reassess how they manage and sanction player behaviour. The narrative extends beyond the back pages and into the lives of young players thrust into the spotlight, where fame, wealth and temptation create a volatile mix. The legacy of football's lad culture, spearheaded by figures like Paul Gascoigne, continues to cast a long shadow over the sport. Paul Gascoigne's struggle with alcoholism is a stark example of the dangerous consequences of the drinking culture in English football. In October 1998, Gascoigne's battle with alcohol reached a critical point when he was admitted to Priory Hospital following a binge where he consumed 32 shots of whiskey, an incident that highlighted the depth of his addiction. Despite being unconscious upon arrival, he insisted on leaving the clinic early, 
which was against medical advice and indicative of his ongoing struggle with sobriety. Over the years, Gascoigne's alcoholism led to multiple stints in rehab, including a significant period in 2001 when Everton's chairman sought professional help for him, culminating in a stay at a clinic in Arizona where he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Despite these interventions, Gascoigne returned to alcohol, demonstrating the cyclical nature of his addiction. His behavior led to numerous legal issues, including a high-profile incident in 2008 at the Malmaison Hotel in Newcastle, which resulted in him being sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Gascoigne's life continued to spiral out of control, marked by arrests for drink driving, drug possession, and public disturbances. Since 1985, English football has enforced a ban on alcohol consumption within sight of the pitch across its top five tiers, from the Premier League to the National League, as a measure to deter hooligan behavior. This legislation also led to concerns about the rapid consumption of alcohol during halftime breaks. In 2021, Discussions about amending this rule were initiated by former sports minister Tracy Crouch, who argued that the existing regulation might prompt fans to drink excessively in a short period. However, Mark Roberts, a senior police figure in football, expressed skepticism about this proposal. In Scotland, a similar prohibition has been in effect since the 1980 Scottish Cup final incident involving Celtic and Rangers, with alcohol being banned in all areas of football stadiums except for corporate hospitality sections. The potential lifting of this ban was debated in the context of hosting UEFA Euro 2020, but police authorities voiced opposition. A notable incident highlighting the consequences of alcohol consumption at football matches occurred in 2012 when Sheffield Wednesday goalkeeper Chris Kirkland was attacked by an inebriated Leeds United fan on the pitch. The assailant, who had consumed several cans of lager and 0.75 litres of vodka prior to the game, followed by additional pints of cider, was later sentenced to 16 weeks in prison and handed a six-year ban from attending football matches. In 2010, the tragicomedy of his life was further illustrated when he bizarrely appeared during the Raoul Moat manhunt, claiming to be Moat's brother, offering bizarre peace offerings like chicken and fishing rods. This incident led to legal action against the Sun newspaper, claiming their coverage had adversely affected his treatment for alcoholism. By 2013, Gascoigne's health had deteriorated to the point of needing intensive care in the US while undergoing treatment for alcoholism. His struggles continued with further arrests for assault and public disorder, leading to repeated rehab stints. In 2017, an attempt at rehabilitation signaled a serious intent to become sober, yet his battle with alcoholism and its repercussions remained a public spectacle, culminating in his arrest and subsequent acquittal on charges of sexual assault in 2018. Gascoigne's journey is emblematic of the destructive path that the drinking culture in English football can lead to, illustrating not only personal devastation, but also the broader societal impacts of such behavior. Yet amidst the chaos, there is a move towards professionalism and self-care, championed by the likes of Arsene Wenger and Sir Alex Ferguson, who have reshaped the ethos of their clubs prioritizing health and discipline over hedonistic excess. The journey from the boozy camaraderie of the Tuesday club to the more refined and controlled environments of today's top clubs shows a sport in evolution, grappling with its identity and responsibilities. The troubling relationship between alcohol and English football has often spilled over into violent and criminal behavior, underscoring the severity of the drinking culture among some players. Notable incidents illustrate how excessive drinking has led to serious legal consequences and tarnished careers. Lee Bowyer's notorious meltdown in a McDonald's after a night of heavy drinking in 1996 is one such instance. His aggressive demand for a cheeseburger outside of regular serving hours escalated into a destructive outburst, resulting in a conviction for a fray and a substantial fine. This incident highlighted how alcohol could fuel impulsive and aggressive behavior in high-profile athletes, casting a shadow over their public image and professional responsibilities, Marlon King's 2009 conviction for sexual assault and causing bodily harm in a nightclub further exemplifies the dark side of football's drinking culture. His excessive drinking not only led to a violent assault, but also unveiled his history of alcohol-related offences, raising questions about the repeated behaviour patterns of some footballers when under the influence. Similarly, Adam Hamill's attack on two female paramedics in 2012 following a night of heavy drinking, brought to light the broader societal implications of such conduct. The incident not only resulted in a suspended prison sentence for Hamill, 
but also spark discussions about the responsibility of football clubs in managing their players' off-field behaviour. In more extreme cases, such as that of Sean Newton in 2017, alcohol and drug use led to criminal activities far removed from the football field. His bizarre explanation of participating in a treasure hunt while committing a burglary under the influence underscores the blurred reality some players face due to substance abuse. Moreover, the tragic death of Jordan Sinnott in 2020, following a drunken altercation, serves as a grim reminder of the potentially fatal consequences of the toxic mix of alcohol and aggression prevalent in some quarters of the football community. These incidents, among others, paint a troubling picture of the intersection between alcohol abuse and the behavior of footballers, calling for a re-evaluation of the culture within the sport and its impact on individuals and society at large. Since 1985, English football has enforced a ban on alcohol consumption within sight of the pitch across its top five tiers, from the Premier League to the National League, as a measure to deter hooligan behaviour. This legislation also led to concerns about the rapid consumption of alcohol during half-time breaks. In 2021, discussions about amending this rule were initiated by former sports minister Tracy Crouch, who argued that the existing regulation might prompt fans to drink excessively in a short period. However, Mark Roberts, a senior police figure in football, expressed skepticism about this proposal. In Scotland, a similar prohibition has been in effect since the 1980 Scottish Cup final incident involving Celtic and Rangers, with alcohol being banned in all areas of football stadiums except for corporate hospitality sections. The potential lifting of this ban was debated in the context of hosting UEFA Euro 2020, but police authorities voiced opposition. A notable incident highlighting the consequences of alcohol consumption at football matches occurred in 2012 when Sheffield Wednesday goalkeeper Chris Kirkland was attacked by an inebriated Leeds United fan on the pitch. The assailant, who had consumed several cans of lager and 0.75 litres of vodka prior to the game, followed by additional pints of cider, was later sentenced to 16 weeks in prison and handed a six-year ban from attending football matches. In conclusion, English football stands at a crossroads where the allure of the past's raucous escapades clashes with the demands for a more disciplined and conscientious approach to the game and its players. As the sport continues to navigate its complex relationship with fame, fortune and personal responsibility, the hope is for a future where talent and integrity can coexist, both on and off the pitch.